Hi guys, I'll now be describing to you aspects related to the GI tract. I'll begin the discussion by describing an unconventional topic that is bleeding from the gut. You are familiar about the fact that upper GI bleeding versus lower GI bleeding, the anatomical landmark that we use is called as ligament or trites. While I jot it down, I want to highlight the fact that because nowadays the questions that come are of the integrated variety, so they can definitely mix up the information of anatomy with that of the clinical sciences. Therefore, you have to remember the fact that if the bleed will be occurring proximal to the duodeno-jejunal flexure, that's where the ligament arthritis is present, then we're going to call it an upper GI bleed, distal to that is the lower GI. When a patient comes to your hospital puking blood, it's going to be a scary situation. You will have to put a whiteboard candela, manage the shock component of the person. I'm going to put up a question to you guys here because I know the fact that the leading cause of hematemesis is peptic ulcer disease that you are aware of. Can you think of the least common cause for upper GI bleeding? As I'll describe to you the data, you will notice that I'll be describing the lesions in decreasing order of importance. The most common one is peptic ulcer disease. The question in your mind should be, what is the least common cause? If you read the topic from any of the textbooks or maybe you've attended some classes. Please remember the fact that when it comes to peptic ulcer disease, it's literally going to be a fountain, a gush of blood in the gut. It could either be a bleeding duodenal ulcer, it could be a gastric ulcer. Though gastric ulcer versus duodenal ulcer are discussed subsequently in this app, I want you to understand that perforation is something that you commonly see with the duodenal ulcer if it is anteriorly located. But if the duodenal ulcer is posteriorly located, then it can erode into the gastroduodenal artery and there can be a torrential hemorrhage which can even cause the person to reach your hospital with unrecordable blood pressure. Whenever you read about a bleed anywhere in the body, then you should always know the source. In duodenal ulcer, it is the breach of the wall of the gastroduodenal artery, whereas gastric ulcer is commonly located on the lesser curvature. It's close to incisor angularis. The blood vessel that can be eroded in this case would be the left gastric artery. And as I said, this is going to be a torrential hemorrhage and the person might be brought into your hospital with an unrecordable blood pressure. So you will put a wide bore cannula. White bore cannula would mean that you would be putting, let me say, a gray cannula, not a green one, a gray cannula. Ideally, you should be putting an orange one. But for putting an orange cannula, a doctor should have taken a training of ATLS, that is Advanced Trauma Life Support. If a doctor is not trained well, you know, you might waste an expensive orange cannula. That's the widest bore available. So instead of that, you can be using subsequently a gray cannula. Now you have secured the gray cannula in place and what are you going to give to this patient? Initially you are going to give fluids but if he talks about a patient who is a crashing patient, by crashing I mean systolic blood pressure is lesser than 90 millimeters going down to 70, 60 or even a ridiculously lower values. You know that the auto regulation of the brain is getting compromised. You need to treat the hypovolemic shock of this person on a war footing. So you have definitely put in the gray cannula in the site, you have rushed IV fluids, you have given a bolus of normal saline to this patient, but the main treatment for this bleeding patient would be to initiate massive blood transfusion. Massive blood transfusion is itself a lecture that I have taken in hematology. Here I have just used the short form massive transfusion protocol should always be taking precedence over anything else. You can manage the bleeder subsequently. At the moment, my focus will be to ensure hemodynamic stability of this person. So push in a bolus of fluid, give massive transfusion protocol, give packed RBCs, give this guy subsequently again repeat packed RBCs and try to bring the blood pressure back to normal. I could have said whole blood also, but most of the time in hospitals, in massive transfusion protocol, it is blood components that are used. Once hemodynamic stability is achieved, then you will go in for an upper J endoscopy of this person and you would be able to visualize the ulcer bleeding. You can inject adrenaline at the base of the ulcer that will cause vasoconstriction action and then we can do a cauterization of the base of the ulcer. So most of the time when it comes to a bleeding peptic ulcer disease, subsequently after hemodynamic stability, you need to control the bleed. When this facility was not available, it had to be surgically done. So the person was taken to the OT, a laparotomy used to be done and we used to locate the bleeder and ligate it. The number one cause of puking of blood by any patient is peptic ulcer disease after which you should remember it as drug induced gastritis. 
I am talking about erosive gastritis. Now, H. pylori causes non-erosive gastritis, but drug-induced gastritis would mainly be thanks to the security system. The prostaglandins are going to play a stomach protective role if you are prescribing COX-1 inhibitors to a person on a long-term basis or a person is abusing painkillers. Like a obese lady, she is having osteoarthritis of the knees, so you had advised a total knee replacement. Now, Indian patients are Indian patients. She thought the doctor is trying to earn money or commission or something like that. So, she did not get surgery done. If you do not get surgery done, when you require a TKR, the joint space is reduced. Well, she won't be able to even go to the washroom. So, for her to be in a position to go about her daily activities, she will start popping in painkillers. And subsequently, the drug-induced gastritis, the erosive gastritis component can cause her to even develop vomiting of blood. Only then should you answer portal hypertension. So don't straight away answer portal hypertension as a leading cause. Yes, please remember the fact that if a multiple choice question begins by saying that a person landed up in a hospital right now, the person is having two episodes, three episodes of vomiting is going to make it very dramatic and says that on per abdominal examination, there is a splenomegaly. That is when you will think in terms of portal hypertension. You don't have a splenomegaly in peptic ulcer disease. Portal hypertension is defined as pressure in the portal vein more than 5 millimeters of mercury. It can go up to 10. Once it goes up to 12, the varices are going to pop off. They're going to rupture. So do remember the fact that in portal hypertension, we are basically talking about rupture of the esophageal varices and we can prevent them from bleeding also no? if we diagnose them early. But lots of time in India, you would be having an alcoholic patient who's never visited a hospital. All he does is drink, develops alcoholic cirrhosis, goes into portal hypertension and then bleeds. So esophageal varices are one of the leading causes for uh, development of uh, vomiting of blood in a person. But that will be answered only if in the question you are having this information of spinomegaly concomitantly given. I want to highlight the fact that if they ask you what is the leading cause of portal hypertension, then you know that this is alcoholic cirrhosis. But this is going to be damn easy and obviously the examiner would not like to ask you routine data. So I put up a scenario here. I have a person who is having liver damage but is negative for viral markers because you are aware of the fact that if it is uh, alcohol not responsible, then the hepatotrophic viruses could contribute to development or damage to the liver. So I'm giving you a situation where I have a non-alcoholic patient. He's not even touched alcohol ever, ever in his life. He's having negative viral marker status, like never had any of the hepatotrophic viruses infection. There is no metabolic cause in the patient also. Like for example, Wilson disease, hemochromatosis, they are the metabolic causes of the damage to the liver. So I'm ruling out the traditional causes, but still there is cirrhosis in the liver or there is damage in the liver. Well, please remember the fact that if they ask you what is the number one cause of portal hypertension, agreed alcoholic cirrhosis, but he gave a situation in the exam where he described a person having liver cirrhosis. He said the person is non-alcoholic. He is negative for viral markers. The guy is turning out to be negative for metabolic causes like you did a serloplasmin value, did a 24 a urinary copper negative, serum ferritin values are normal. So metabolic causes have also been ruled out. Well, then the reason why he is having cirrhosis and then subsequently a portal hypertension would be answered as cryptogenic cirrhosis. Cryptogenic as the name suggests would mean that uh, it is difficult to identify the cause. When I was a student at your age, the term that was used to describe cryptogenic cirrhosis, which is the term now, was NCPF, that is non-serotic portal fibrosis. But because these old questions are still available on various online domains, so I thought I should mention this before you. In point number three, I want to highlight portal hypertension, pressure more than 5 millimeter. Once the pressure goes more than 12, the esophageal varices will pop off. But the point is, if it's not an alcoholic patient, it's negative for viral markers, there's no metabolic cause, then you need to remember as cryptogenic cirrhosis. In the same breath, I would also like to mention the fact that if portal hypertension is asked to you from pediatrics domain, and he says, why would the child have portal hypertension? Why would the child be puking blood and having a splenomegaly? Then from pediatric perspective, the answer would be extrahepatic portal vein obstruction.
AHPVO is the usual short form that is used. So I've just done three miscellaneous questions here. Alcoholic cirrhosis is obviously number one. You'll never mess up on that. But in a guy with negative viral markers and the remaining scenario, it's cryptogenic cirrhosis. The pediatric version is AHPVO. And you need to understand what is now going to happen to this person in a sense that what intervention would be done to control this bleed. Can you tell me the source of bleeding in esophageal varices, guys? The source of blood, I mean, I know it's esophageal veins. Can I have the technical name? The technical name for this would be coronary veins. Again, looks very surprising, no? Because coronary is something that we associate with the heart. But those lower esophageal veins are sometimes referred in anatomy also as coronary veins. And I just want to highlight once again, whenever you are reading about bleed from anywhere, the source of bleeding is something that you have to have to remember. Let's now talk about what are we going to do in this particular patient who's having bleeding esophageal varices. I'm going to decrease the portal vein pressure using octreotide. Had I diagnosed this case earlier in non-bleeding varices to prevent them from becoming bleeding, we shall be using a non-selective beta blocker that is propranolol. Yes, the same drug which has been taught to you for prophylaxis of migraine. The same drug that I've discussed as the drug of choice for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Propranolol has been told to you for best for prophylaxis of migraine, best drug when it comes to management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The same molecule is today coming in for management of non-bleeding varices. However, like all Indian patients, he's not going to come early. Most Indian patients come when it's going to be really, really red. In a case of bleeding esophageal varices, to reduce the pressure in the portal veins and the portosystemic collateral circulation, what I need to definitely ensure is that first the pressure in the portal vein should go down. So I'm going to start the person on an infusion of octreotide. Apart from this, in some MCQs, he may not have octreotide in the options, then answer would be turly present. As I've highlighted, all the data that I'm going to give you is in decreasing order of importance. So first it is octreotide, then it's going to be turly present. If he says, what is the treatment of choice for bleeding esophageal varices, your answer would be that you would go in for an endoscopy and then go ahead with sclerotherapy. We're going to inject a sclerosing agent in the veins, which is going to prevent them from even a re-bleeding scenario. Therefore, there are three causes that I've discussed at the moment before you and the fourth one now comes up, which is going to be Mallory-Weiss syndrome. You have read about Mallory-Weiss syndrome multiple times in surgery as well. So let me just see whether you can recall the majority of facts. The question is, where is the site of tear? Where is actually the tear present? Because every time when you are reading regarding the manifestations occurring in a patient, you need to know the site of the tear and you also need to know the source of bleeding. mallory weiss syndrome is commonly seen. The clinical history that would be given would be a person who's a hardcore alcoholic. He goes out for drinking with his friends like they go to a bar and these guys are ordering drinks in large amounts, binge drinking. Or it could be a pregnant lady. She's in the first trimester and she's suffering from hyper emesis gravidarum. Whenever you're going to read these two statements, that is binge drinking slash hyperemesis gravidarum, then in those circumstances, when you read any of the two scenarios and the person is having extensive amount of vomiting, there's a definite possibility that the person will start retching. Now, because there is retching, retching would mean that there is a sound of like the person is trying to vomit. Nothing is going to come out because he's already vomited multiple times. But now what's going to happen is that the forceful vomiting can contribute to a tear. So they have asked what is the site of this tear. Remember, it's only a partial thickness tear. No, it's not a through and through rupture. If, it, if we're talking about a through and through rupture, that becomes Boerhaave syndrome. We talk about Mallory VS. The site of tear in this particular case would be answered by you as the lower esophageal sphincter. If he says, where does the tear start from? Now listen to the technical information. If he says, where does the tear start from? Then the tear will not start from the sphincter, you know, because vomiting is reverse peristalsis. So the bleed is going to start or the tear is going to start actually from the stomach. It's going to go in a retrograde fashion. That is, it's going to extend from cardia to the lower esophageal sphincter. Now listen to my next words even more carefully. When you going to send in a scope, when, you, when the camera goes inside, the camera will first go in the esophagus and then in the stomach. So for you, when you send in the scope, the tear will appear at the sphincter. But actually, the sphincter is subsequently involved. The tear starts from the cardia. 
So there are two separate aspects. Where is the tear visualized when you go, go in for endoscopy? Yes, the lower esophageal sphincter, but actually it started from the cardia in a reverse direction. The reverse peristalsis contributed to it. So whenever you read a question of this particular scenario, alcoholic followed by binge drinking, I've explained in cardiology, right? Alcoholic binge drinking, you need to think in terms of possibility of uh, atrial fibrillation and holiday heart syndrome. But today I'm saying that this guy or this lady who's having hyperemesis gravidarum, they just vomited. And in fact, with vomitus came blood. The moment the person saw blood, this person might freak out and they might even be loss of consciousness. They might be vasovagal syncope in the person. I'll highlight the statement once again. Whenever you read a question in which it is given retching in a patient, it could be any of the two scenarios, retching in a person and then talks about vomiting of blood. This can freak out anybody irrespective of the age group however you know you would consider yourself to be tough if there's going to be blood in the vomitus it's going to make everybody feel very nervous so there was a loss of consciousness in this person vasovagal syncope will definitely be or can be present it may or may not be so i'm just writing plus minus when this person reached my hospital i did a quick examination of the vitals the heart rate was dramatically increased to let me say 110 per minute the blood pressure of this patient was at the movement on the lower side. Let me give you a value of 100 by 70 or 110 by 70. So what I'm trying to say is that per se in Malorivia syndrome, though looking at that blood, it might look, it is in very large amounts and the person might even uh, freak out and might become unconscious. But usually you do not have person going into shock. Why? Because in this particular case, the tear which is present is submucosal. No? You do not have a direct arterial excess or maybe branches of the artery might be involved. Malorivia syndrome, guys, is a self-limiting condition. It's a submucosal tear that is present. So as such, the threat to life with malorivia will be relatively lesser. This explains the fact that why in this person, by the time they reach the casualty, the person is up and awake and uh, with conservative management, the patient will recover. Malorivia syndrome is a self-limiting condition. The submucosal tear will not cause any threat to life. But if the bleed reoccurs, like he puked once again and the blood came maybe in slightly increased amount this time, then you obviously need to be a bit more aggressive. Then you will go in for an endoscopy. You will be injecting adrenaline at the base of the tear. Most of the time that alone will be sufficient to control the bleed. If required, you can also do cauterization or he might even use the word endoscopic clipping so any of these maneuvers can be done for controlling the bleed in mallory vias to majority of cases this would not be required because i explained to you that this is a submucosal tear this also leads us to the scenario of what is the source of bleeding here so we we'll next talk about what is the source of bleeding in this particular case because we're talking about the cardia and subsequently the tear going up to the lower esophageal sphincter the source of bleeding in this case would also be answered as left gastric artery this is the second time today that i've described the left gastric artery as a source of bleeding from anywhere first i talked about gastric ulcer then in malorivius the subsequent condition that can contribute to upper gi bleeding and a manifestation of hematemesis is called as dulu foys lesion well, it is not also the rare one. It is less common, but not the rare one. So my question that I put up right in the starting of this video saying which is the rarest cause is coming up at point number six. I still have given you sufficient window period. I've given you sufficient time to think about it. Dilufa's lesion is an aberrant submucosal artery. Most of the time, you see, blood vessels are supposed to be present, obviously in the gut, but they're towards the serosal side. If they're towards the submucosal side or the mucosal side, then what basically happens is that the churning action of the stomach can cause damage to these blood vessels itself. So aberrant submucosal artery is what we call as Dilufa's lesion. It can cause a pinpoint bleed, which might be difficult to pick up initially. If he says, what is the rare cause? Your answer will be a vascular malformation. In fact, I gave you a hint by showing an image right in the starting. When I was asking you what is the least common cause, you can see this appearance, no? The hint I gave you in the starting of this lecture was this particular image. This that I've shown before you is called as watermelon stomach. And this would be seen with a condition called as GAVE, that is gastric antral vascular ectasia. I showed this image actually two times to you. 
the superior image in this case you can make out some protuberances of these veins so this that i've shown before you is an endoscopic image of non-bleeding esophageal varices the inferior image is anyway a watermelon stomach your answer would be given as what i've just jotted down before you let's just practice the full form whenever i write down short forms i would personally advise you to just note it down on a slip on pad the full forms because you never know when it might slip out of your mind so if you write it once then it becomes or tends to become a long term memory gastric antral vascular ectasia is a vascular malformation that initially might be missed out because the lesions may not be so prominent as i've highlighted most of the time the mcq that will come on this topic will say the phrase watermelon stomach is found in the answer would be given as gastric antral vascular ectasia these are the usual causes that you encounter for upper j bleeding and that's actually a table in harrison that i've tried to highlight if he begins a mcq of upper j bleeding by talking about an unrecordable bp then first always talk about hemodynamic stability once you ensure that hemodynamic stability then you are on the course to go in for fault finding of what could actually be present and you must always look for a spleen if it's present it always tells you that it's going to be portal hypertension so at least two carry home messages here are leading cause of upper g bleeding pod rare cause is gastric antral vascular ectasia but if he mentions a spleen present in a person if he says alcoholic piece of cake you know never never a problem but he usually will talk about a non-alcoholic patient where i've given you the scenario of cryptogenic cirrhosis as well and that definitely has to be kept in your mind the next topic that i'll explain to you is hematochezia which basically means fresh blood in the stool the most common cause of this in mcqs should be answered as diverticulitis please remember the fact that overall in clinical practice however the number one cause is not diverticulitis it is piles because piles is very simple an answer the examiner knows that you will be able to get the question right and he obviously does not want to make you feel so comfortable that is why piles or hemorrhoids is not given in the options and the answer would be given as diverticulitis you are aware from surgery that hemorrhoids will be of the two varieties that is external and internal hemorrhoids we are discussing here about internal hemorrhoids which are going to be responsible for painless blood or painless bleeding that will occur post defecation you see when it comes to external hemorrhoids they are horribly painful but when it comes to internal hemorrhoids this is going to be a painless bleed the bleed will however be occurring post defecation so the term that will usually be given in the textbook will be flash in the pan what i imply by the word flash in the pan is that the person has defecated already and then there's suddenly a spurt of blood and uh, when this person gets up after using the toilet seat that's when he sees all that blood and he, it looks very very scary initially to the person lots of these patients might even turn anemic because of this continuous loss of blood before they actually seek medical advice do remember the fact painless bleeding post defecation why i highlighted that is if he is going to talk about a anal fissure anal fissure is again going to be horribly painful and there would be streaking of blood on the stool but in this case there's going to be a post defecation scenario of a painless bleed which can be written in multiple choice questions as flash in the pan if he gives this classical term anyway you are familiar with it otherwise incidence wise i've already highlighted before you that internal hemorrhoids are relatively the number one cause responsible for this if he says what is the best way for diagnosis of this condition your answer would be given as proctoscopy and now when you put in a proctoscope you will be able to see the veins prolapsing into the lumen of the proctoscope at 3 o'clock position 7 o'clock position and 11 o'clock position if this is the area where the veins are prolapsing then the technical term that we use for this is called as primary piles remember the fact that there are two separate things one is primary and secondary piles second is going to be grading of piles that i'll explain to you you see if the piles are present at any of the following areas that are marked in green that is in between the areas of 3 o'clock 7 o'clock and 11 o'clock then i'm going to use the word secondary piles so primary and secondary is mainly related to the location component however he can also mention regarding the grading part i have seen lot of people messing up with the grading part so though this is discussed in surgery let's do a quick evaluation here for the grading of piles when it comes to grade 4 this person will say doctor it's very embarrassing and he says why it's embarrassing is because he says doctor after i've defecated obviously there is bleeding but apart from this he can feel something coming out of the anus which is actually the veins which are prolapsing out of the anus of this person 
he will then say that I try to push them back with my finger that is digital repositioning and he says that in spite of him pushing the veins back with his finger the digital reposition fails. On the other hand, if a person tells you the same information that he goes to the washroom, there's going to be blood at the end of defecation, then the veins come out. He tries to go in for digital reposition. Alphabet R here stands for reposition. But digital reposition is successful, then I'm going to call it a grade 3 piles. However, when you talk about grade 2 piles in a person, he will tell you that veins collapse out, but there's going to be a spontaneous reduction. You see, this time, he does not have to use his finger to push back the veins. I know you are familiar about this from surgery, but it's a quick recap here. When it comes to grade 1 piles, that would mean that this would be visible only on proctoscopy. Why I have I spoken about it is mainly to remind you the fact that there was a question which said secondary piles or second degree. So secondary piles would mean the location. And when you talk about second degree, that would obviously mean the severity component. And obviously the treatment of this will be studied by you from surgery. I'll give a bit from surgery, like grade 3 and grade 4 piles, you will be going for surgery. That is a hemorrhoidectomy. On the other hand, when it comes to a grade 2 pile, you can either be going in for banding or cryosurgery. Cryosurgery is usually preferred nowadays because you are going to apply liquid nitrogen probe and the tissue will freeze and the pile will basically fall off. Can you tell me from anatomy slash surgery, the source of bleeding, like I've highlighted in this discussion that whenever you're reading about bleeding anywhere from the any part of the body, you need to know the source of the bleeding. Can you tell me the source of bleeding with respect to internal hemorrhoids? Well, you guessed it right from surgery domain as well as anatomy, you know that the vein that's going to bleed in this case is going to be the superior rectal vein. That's again a question that they have asked in the exam. But because all this is very easy, so most of the time examiners are assuming that you are aware of this. And that is the reason why they love to ask about diverticulitis. Now, diverticulitis is again something that is less commonly seen in India because we Indians, you know, even if we are non-vegetarians, we mainly eat white meat and in between we eat vegetables also. I'm talking about next a hardcore non-vegetarian and this guy is eating beef on a daily basis. You can think of an American patient, you can think of a European patient. I mean, people who uh, consume large amount of beef or meat on regular basis without intake of any vegetables they would be suffering from constipation on long-term basis and this constipation can then trigger development of first diverticulosis please appreciate the fact for anybody to develop a culitis first he should be having a pre-existing diverticulosis and why do you get a diverticulosis is mainly because of the constipation component in a hardcore non-vegetarian I'm not talking about a recent onset constipation. You see, let me say a guy is 65 years of age and he started getting constipation for previous six months. That is worsening. It could be carcinoma rectum also. On the other hand, in this case, the constipation has been present for, let me say, 20 years, 30 years. I mean, a long duration constipation. He has tried alternative medicine. He's like an Indian patient. He has tried homeopathic, Ayurvedic. He knows all the brands. Allopathic, Ayurvedic, homeopathic, everything that he has tried, but the constipation is still very much present. And now this guy ended up with diverticulosis. And then from culosis, he can progress to colitis. How? Please remember that diverticulosis and colitis is commonly seen in the sigmoid colon. The narrowest part of the colon, you are aware that the most dilatable part of the colon is the cecum. Similarly, the narrowest part of the colon is the sigmoid colon. So sigmoid colon takes the maximum impact in constipation. I repeat that again. The most widest and the dilatable part of the colon happens to be the cecum and the narrowest part of the colon happens to be the sigmoid colon. So here sigmoid colon is taking the hit. Once you are having this formation of diverticulosis, now in yellow I've shown these fecolates which are physically obstructing the mouth of the diverticula. Inside this, the bacteria will continue to multiply and keep on producing toxins and these toxins can cause inflammation. So, culosis is now having colitis and God forbid, there is also a distinct possibility that if this perforates, then there is going to be even contamination of the peritoneal cavity. There is going to even be a fecal spillage. I mean, you are aware of the fact that the worst kind of peritonitis that you can ever encounter is a fecal contamination of the peritoneal cavity. That can happen in this case. And that is why it's important that you are able to pick up this condition relatively early. So most MCQs that will come on this topic will describe a geriatric age group person. 
he will initially talk about the fact that this guy is having constipation uh, obstructive symptoms in the form of uh, constipation will make you think in terms of carcinoma rectum but as i have sensitized you if it is going to be a recent onset manifestations of constipation this guy was having regular bowel habits all his life it's just that recently he started having constipation yes that is when you will think in terms of the fact that there could be a malignancy but this guy has been suffering from this for a long duration so i'm saying the word chronic constipation and then non-vegetarian person Today when he came to my clinic, he had severe left iliophosa pain. It was excruciating but initially I did not take this guy seriously because if I know a person is having constipation, left iliophosa pain, he may not have passed too. But what this patient said next immediately sent the alarm bells ringing in my brain. He said, Doc, there have been two episodes of fresh blood in the stool and that is making me think what's going on. I mean, this guy is having constipation, understandable, but he's never had fresh blood in the stool. So whenever you read this kind of a profile of a geriatric age group patient presenting with excruciating left iliacosa pain and hematochesia, it is diverticulitis, which is to be thought. He will ask you, what is the next best investigation? For abdominal emergencies like diverticulitis, you can do a CT abdomen and can make a diagnosis. Here I have seen a common mistake being done by a lot of guys. The common mistake done is they tend to answer barium enema. Now please remember the topic that we are studying at the moment is diverticulitis that's the medical emergency but diverticulosis per se is the one that is picked up with barium enema so you need to get it in the right perspective if i simply ask you how do you identify culosis or diverticulosis barium enema colitis that's going to be answered as ct abdomen you see, because this is a very classical figure, you can see the outpouchings which are present in this case. You can definitely make up the appearance of these uh, saculations in the sigmoid colon of the person. So this physical appearance that I have highlighted before you is one that is technically represented as saw tooth pattern. Most of the time, barium enema is an answer because most guys have read diverticulosis even in radiology. The sort of pattern on barium enema as I have shown here on an enlarged view to you is going to be a very classical finding for culosis but culitis is a medical emergency for which a CT abdomen should be done and God forbid you know if you fail to diagnose it then a fecal contamination of the peritoneal cavity will occur that would be the worst kind of peritonitis that you can expect in any patient. For the treatment of diverticulitis, it will depend on whether the fecal contamination of the peritoneal cavity has occurred or not. Assuming the fact that you made a diagnosis earlier, uh, if it's a localized disease, a localized abscess, person will be made nil per orally, IV antibiotics will be given, person will be put on IV fluids, then gradually introduced on liquid diet, liquid, uh, I mean, a semi-solid diet, then subsequently he will resume normal diet with dietary rehabilitation. For treatment of chelosis, you can again read it up from surgery because the topic is having a surgical domain as well. But I again want to highlight the fact that whenever in the exam you read the following information, if you read it is written sort of pattern on ECG versus sort of pattern on EEG versus sort of pattern on a CT abdomen, you know the fact that the answers will definitely be different. Sort of pattern on ECG is always atrial flutter that I know most guys can answer spot on. If he says sort of pattern on EEG, then your answer would be REM phase of sleep. Whereas for CT abdomen, we have just discussed it right now, it's going to be answered as diverticulitis. Do take care of this silly mistake that can occur with people, colitis versus culosis. That error of judgment should definitely not occur in the question. Now, assuming the fact that there is no diverticulitis in the patient, then the next cause that should be thought of is inflammatory bowel disease. There are two variants of this. I have taken a separate discussion on IBD, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Crohn's is relatively more common abroad. I mean, mostly Americans or Europeans are more predisposed to having Crohn's disease as compared to India, ulcerative colitis is more commonly formed. I'm very sure you are aware of the fact that when it comes to Crohn, because there is going to be a stricture formation, so most patients of Crohn's will initially be having colicky pain that can even interfere with sleep. The person might wake up in the middle of night with colicky pain. But in ulcerative colitis, because there's a rectum involvement, there's a proctitis, so the presentation of ulcerative colitis is mainly in the form of a painless bloody diarrhea. 
patients of ulcerative colitis might have to go to the washroom as much as 10 to 15 times per day that's almost like one time per uh, one per every hour so this will be pretty disability or a severe disability in a sense that person can't even go for a holiday a lot of these people with ulcerative colitis will tell you that i've not gone for a holiday because i need to go to the washroom every one hour every half an hour i need to be near the washroom near the toilet and in this particular person, because he is losing blood, so not only would you get a pallor, but along with blood, proteins will also be lost. So if you're going to check the serum albumin of these patients, it will definitely be lesser. This explains the fact that why these patients will be having weight loss, muscle wasting, and the description that is given here is called as protein losing enteropathy. The common example of protein losing enteropathy that we tend to study happens to be a menetrius disease where there's a hyperplasia of the rugosities of the stomach, but even ulcerative colitis or let me say malabsorption syndrome examples, they're all examples of protein losing enteropathy. I want to highlight that in ulcerative colitis, the hypoalbuminemia component could result in patient coming to you with obviously the standard complaints of going to the washroom again and again and no fecal matter, only blood is coming, little bit of mucus is coming along with puffy eyes and even a pedal edema this puffy eyes and pedal edema component as i've highlighted can be explained by the hypoalbuminemia presentation of these patients and uh, then there can be a couple of antibodies that can aid in diagnosis i want to highlight here before you that inflammatory bubble disease is not an autoimmune disorder mark my words there it is not an autoimmune disorder it's an inflammatory disorder why that happens or why do you have inflammatory bubble disease there's a separate lecture for it but don't answer it as an autoimmune disorder the question that came in the exam had four options sle rheumatoid arthritis hashimoto's and ibd and the question said which is not an autoimmune disorder sle you know is an autoimmune disorder hashimoto rheumatoid arthritis they're all autoimmune inflammatory bubble disease is not an autoimmune disorder i mean it might look a little you know atypical to you to hear at this moment because we we are i'm gonna write some antibodies here see yes there are some antibodies but they're not diagnostic they're just an association they're not diagnostic they're just an association the antibody for crohn's is aska I will just write the full form and you can, if not very comfortable, note it down so that at least uh, if you're having audiovisual stimulus along with uh, listening to me and if you're noting it down, that would be additional input into your brain. Anti-Saccharomyces cerevisiae antibody help you in identifying Crohn's. It is one of the association in ulcerative colitis. However, the association is that of PNK. There's a separate discussion on inflammatory bubble disease. Till now, I have taught you three reasons why a person could be having fresh blood in the stool. It could be hemorrhoids. If it's not hemorrhoids, then by exclusion, diverticulitis. If it is not there, it could be inflammatory bubble disease. The next cause which is to be considered here is malignancy. You are aware of the fact that cancer of the right side of the colon will mainly be having bleeding manifestations. And when it comes to cancer of the rectum, then it will mainly be having obstructive symptoms. I'm not saying that bleeding will not occur in carcinoma rectum. Yes, it can occur. But predominantly, this is what the pathologist would have said, the surgeon would have said, and I have also highlighted that bleeding manifestations, it could even be occult blood sometimes, and gradually it becomes obviously a visible bleeding. But bleeding is more common with cancer of the right side of the colon, and carcinoma rectum mainly presents with obstructive symptoms. Now, for obstructive symptoms, he will describe a geriatric age group person who's having a recent onset constipation. Like he says that he has always had good bubble habits. He used to get up to, a, to go to the washroom every day morning at 7.30 a.m. And his bubble habits have been very regular for all his life. But for past few months, he does not know. He has been to various physicians or maybe even to a surgeon and they have evaluated him, given him laxatives. But in spite of that, the constipation part is worsening. Due to this, lots of these people might actually start going to ayurvedic and homeopathic people because you see you need a constant follow-up to actually know that okay laxatives are not working so what is wrong maybe it is a malignancy in an old man i need to evaluate it but this guy never came to me i want to highlight that lot of people who are having carcinoma rectum might actually be diagnosed very late because you see after two three consultations a person will lose his faith on you uh, this guy you see he's using his own brain and he's thinking that, okay, I've been to the doctor three times. He has given me laxatives. Every time I go to him, the dose of laxatives has been increased. I'm not improving. So this doctor is not good enough. So he will change the doctor. They'll do doctor shopping and maybe go to alternative medicine. And therefore, the colonoscopy of this person was never, never done. 
65 year old guy with progressive constipation along with this another feature very characteristic that will help you in multiple choice questions will be tenesmus you see this guy will say that he is having or he is having a sensation of incomplete evacuation so he will have to go to the washroom multiple times when you read about this and you also notice that the person is having a weight loss it is imperative that we should be doing a quick workup of this guy failing which liver metastasis will occur as i explained to you that most patients might lose patience with us and might go to an alternative doctor or might go to an alternative pathy so 33% of patients at diagnosis might even be having liver meds which is very substantial that one third of patients of carcinoma rectum when they are diagnosed they already have been having symptoms but because they never went to the same doctor on a consecutive visit you see if i have a patient who's having progressive constipation if it's not improving i will think now what is going on i mean why is he not responding to my medication i will think that there could be a possibility i'll i'll, I'll monitor his weight i'll think in possibility of malignancy but in this particular chap because he did not follow what i said well liver meds have occurred unfortunately you will have to read up carcinoma rectum also from surgery you are familiar with the fact that the staging that is done here is called as duke staging some relative mcqs duke's criteria is read by us then we read also about duke scoring in fact that's a question for you guys while i'm jotting it down where have you studied duke scoring criteria is infective endocarditis i know you will answer where do you read about duke scoring there are three questions the miscellaneous ones that i'm mentioning here before you duke's criteria is the easiest of them infective endocarditis staging has already been told i think i've given you substantial time to think guys duke scoring is what is taught in chronic stable angina where we decide based on the treadmill test report whether you should go for cabg should you go in for a uh, pci with stenting should you go in for uh, intervention or uh, conservative in the form of medication so decision making in chronic stable angina is done on basis of duke scoring these are three miscellaneous mcqs that i want you to remember uh once we have worked up this person of carcinoma rectum on the basis of uh, biopsy findings then uh, the scans of this person will be done to evaluate the distal spread or distant spread of this cancer and depending on that the treatment might be initiated the treatment part has to be very thorough from belly and love you would have read about 5 fluorouracil being injected directly into the hepatic artery for management of those patients who are having metastasis to the liver this is itself a question 5 fluorouracil intraarterial into hepatic artery is used for that is basically to treat those mets with respect to colorectal cancer however now i'm going to give you another scenario instead of just telling you the cause right away i'll create a question before you so that you can understand point number 5 of my discussion i'm having this 50 year old guy his complaints is that he has been having blood in the stool off and on for past few months so he decided to visit a physician and the physician did the same thought process what we are talking about piles diverticulitis and inflammatory bowel disease malignancy work up of this person was done to the level that even colonoscopy was performed because piles was not found he was not having any features of diverticulitis he is not having any features of inflammatory bowel disease so the doctor decided to do a colonoscopy maybe he is missing out on a malignancy the colonoscopy of this person was perfectly normal you see if there's a cancer it must be present as a fungating mass so there must be some lesions of ibd that can be visualized but here the colonoscopy was turning out to be normal this is let me say in year 2020 just before the lockdown occurred or let me say 2020 january that is when this guy's colonoscopy was normal in this guy the symptoms have still been persisting he is still having symptoms sometimes the blood comes sometimes it does not come so in 2021 january this guy was really frustrated he went to a different hospital like let me say first time he came to aims hospital new delhi he got his colonoscopy done and he was not satisfied as people say in india you know government hospital i government hospitals are not good so he decided to go to apollo hospital delhi he went to the best gastroenterologist whom he checked over the internet and even he suggested a colonoscopy because in this guy the symptoms have been persistent when the colonoscopy report came both the gastroenterologist and the patient were a little surprised because they expected some lesion to be present but here colonoscopy report was again normal so this patient is now quizzing you let me say you are the family member of this guy that i have shown at two best hospitals in india 
I have shown to the best gastroenterologist and colonoscopy report is every time coming out to be normal. He is not losing weight. He is not losing weight. He is not having any cachexia. He says otherwise I am healthy. I am eating well. My appetite is fine. But my two reports of colonoscopy are normal over a span of one year. Please appreciate that if it was a cancer that was missed in 2020, by 2021 it would have adopted or uh, it would have become of a sufficient size that you can pick it up. So it's very, very unlikely that the standard causes that I've discussed with you are likely to be missed because gross lesions would be present over a one year period. If you don't treat ulcerative colitis, there's going to be significant proctitis. If it's Crohn's disease missed, you would definitely be having a cobblestone appearance. You would be seeing skip lesions. You would see up the ulcers. So the previous causes have been ruled out and still the guy is having blood in the stool. He is asking you what could be the reason. You would tell this guy that well I suspect there could be a vascular malformation of your colon which could be contributing to this. Like when I was describing vomiting of blood and I explained to you the fact that there could be a vascular region by the name of GAVE, gastric anteral vascular ectasia. Similarly here I want you to understand the fact that if the colonoscopy reports are normal it could be a vascular malformation. This patient of yours, however, the inquisitive one will still ask you, sir, if there's a lesion present, why it could not be seen? Please appreciate the fact that when it comes to angiodysplasia of the colon per se, this lesion may not bleed every day. Most of the time, the bleeding in this case is a oozing of blood. The day you did a colonoscopy, that day the lesion was not bleeding. You see, there was bleeding present on the day you did a colonoscopy, you would have seen. Otherwise, it's a ooze of blood, it's passed out. The person came the next day or the next day. That day the lesion was not bleeding. So you may not be able to pick up the bleeds that occur in this case because they occur on intermittent basis. So it's not that you will continue doing colonoscopy just to see that baby one day he will bleed. Here the question that can be asked subsequently will be what is the investigation of choice for this guy? Well, whenever there is a vascular malformation, the test that you will always do in the person will be angiography. He can write plain angiography or he can write the word CT angiography. But the bottom line is that you need to understand that if it's a vascular malformation, it may not bleed every day. It may bleed intermittently, so it's likely to be missed on initial scans. A CT angiography will, however, be able to identify this lesion. There are two points that I want you to remember. I have informed the data to you in decreasing order of importance, starting from piles diverticulitis onwards. This is obviously rare, but it is asked in the exam because he just wants to see that if a person is having persistent manifestations, and colonoscopy, the scans are perfectly normal, then what could be the reason why he's bleeding? You need to always think in terms of a vascular malformation, which can be picked up by a plain routine or a CT angiography. Now I will be explaining to you a topic by the name of Malena, which is uh, studied by you very extensively, even in your third year onwards. You see, Malena is going to be black terry stool, but I want to emphasize that not every black stool is Malena. You need at least... 60 to 80 ml blood you see even iron supplementation can contribute to formation of a black stool and a hard stool Malena requires 60 to 80 ml of blood with to remain in the gut for a duration between 12 to 16 hours and in this 12 to 16 hours uh, this blood will be acted upon by the various enzymes in the intestine so it will break down the blood and then result in creation of a black terry stool that is gonna be difficult to flush away it will stick to the toilet seat the person will say that if he pressed on the flush button two three times then this tool was washed away malena is black terry stool for this black terry stool to be formed, it requires at least 12 to 16 hours of the pancreatic and the other enzymes which are present in the intestine to degenerate the blood resulting in these manifestations. The usual query of the patient and MCQ will be why is it happening? Your first answer will be this is due to peptic ulcer disease. You see in peptic ulcer disease like a dural ulcer, a patient might vomit blood but some blood due to gravity will also go down and once it will transit to the GI tract, it can contribute to malina. If it is not peptic ulcer disease, this guy could be using or abusing painkillers. Like I gave an example of an obese lady with osteoarthritis of the knees. She was postponing her total knee replacement and now the regular intake of uh, drugs can contribute to COX-1 inhibitors, can contribute to blood loss and can contribute to malena. It could be portal hypertension where coronary veins could be the villain. If it is not this, it could be post a mallory vs. We have discussed in mallory vs. the tear starts from the cardia and involves the lower esophageal sphincter. Though in MCQ, the first answer is sphincter because that is what you are going to see when you send in the scope. 
a mallory bias is ruled out it could be dilufa's lesion well you are noticing a interesting fact here the topic that i am teaching you malena per se is written in the textbook as a cause of lower gi bleeding but all the causes of it are upper gi basically the point is in upper gi bleeding obviously the person will puke blood but the rest of the blood due to gravity will go down and transit through the gut contributing to this manifestation therefore the mcq that came on this topic simply said what is the best test to confirm the diagnosis of malena your answer would be given as upper gi endoscopy why because all the causes which are mentioned here are those of upper gi bleeding this was relatively a easy one so let's now take up regarding hemobilia that implies blood in the bile while i'm writing it question to you guys is why is it happening the most common cause for this would be answered by you as trauma and if he asks what kind of trauma then we're not talking about a road traffic accident we are here talking about a hydrogenic trauma like let me say i'm describing a rookie surgeon this guy has just started practicing laparoscopic cholecystectomy right now and uh, he is not very well skilled in this in these circumstances he may not be able to achieve adequate hemostasis in the operating field and he closes the patient without a proper hemostasis in hemobilia with respect to trauma with respect to laparoscopic cholecystectomy i can say the fact that there is a bleeder there is a bleeder with respect to either the main cystic artery or the branches of the cystic artery which are causing blood to come in the t tube instead of this it could also be instrumentation that is ercp which highlights the fact that investigation of choice for hemobilia cannot be ercp why because ercp is actually the cause of it he can either write instrumentation of the biliary pathway or ercp that could be reason you see the scope was bigger in size so it caused local trauma the third important cause for this can be malignancy because cancers anyway can infiltrate into blood vessels causing manifestations of uh, blood in the bile cholangiocarcinoma in fact there is a variant of cholangiocarcinoma which is present at the hilum and that is at the junction of the left and the right hepatic duct that is called as klatskin tumor so any of these four can contribute to development of blood in the bile the number one cause is trauma hydrogenic trauma and the question then becomes what is the best way to diagnose it do not answer a uh, ercp in this case as i have already sensitized you your answer would again be given as angiography we will see which blood vessel or a sub branch of the blood vessel is the one that is bleeding and in the same setting we'll treat that also because it's going to be a small bleeder so we are going to go in for a gel embolization of the bleeder you do not need to go for re exploration in this case like he gives you a scenario person underwent a lab coli subsequently there is blood in the bile there is blood in the t tube what are you going to do so don't answer re exploration because already he's gone through sufficient amount of surgery and the surgeon did not do a good job when it comes to handling the bleeders he did not achieve it adequate adequate hemostasis in the operating field so now to solve the problem we are going to go in for gel embolization the bleeder that will handle or will manage this patient one more query i can raise up here is hemobilia will you call it a upper gi bleeding or a lower gi bleeding you see right in the starting i told you na ligament or trites is at the duodeno jejunal flexure bile comes in the second part of the duodenum that means it is proximal to the duodeno jejunal flexure so hemobilia would be an example of a upper gi bleeding but the best test for diagnosis of this is not instrumentation not a upper gi endoscopy it's going to be an angiography that is to be answered in fact two times i have answered angiography it could be a plain or a ct angiography which is to be answered for two situations angiodysplasia of the colon and then i have spoken about hemobilia as well so once you get these diseases right i am going to next describe to you regarding the diseases of the esophagus a quick recap of what we have discussed is a patient having hematemesis this could be due to peptic ulcer disease or could be bleeding esophageal varices but in the question if he mentions regarding hemodynamic instability in the form of a unrecordable blood pressure do remember the fact that the first step in management of this person will always be fluid resuscitation i'm not saying that i will increase the blood pressure of this person from unrecordable to 120 by 80 you are all aware of the concept of permissive hypotension i will increase the bp to at least 90 by 60 so that the perfusion of the vital organs can be done so do remember that in unrecordable bp it is a target of 90 by 60 which is to be obtained however if the question simply says what is the leading cause of hematemesis the answer would be given as peptic ulcer disease if he gives a combo 
hematemesis is also given and simultaneously even splenomegaly is written then you should always think in terms of portal hypertension if he says what is the etiology of portal hypertension it could be alcoholic patient non-alcoholic patient if it's non-alcoholic negative viral markers then even ncpf or cryptogenic cirrhosis should be kept in mind the next permutation combination that can be asked is a person having excessive vomiting to the level that is having retching the sound of vomitus is being produced but nothing is coming out from surgery domain you are aware of the fact that if a person is having retching forceful vomiting there can be boer half syndrome but apart from boer half syndrome you always have to keep in mind malorevious also the differentiation is based on the fact that in malorevious there is vomiting of blood whereas in boer half syndrome as i'll explain to you subsequently there is going to be pneumomediastinum and even a subcutaneous emphysema there is macular striad which is encountered in Boerhaave syndrome that is discussed in surgery and subsequently in this discussion on CD in the sequence of lectures in the app as well. So whenever you read about an alcoholic with binge drinking and then vomiting, do not be under impression that all questions are going to be standard malarivious. Because I was discussing here bleeding from the gut, so obviously I had to talk about malarivious where the bleeding will be occurring from the lower esophageal sphincter. But do take a watch or keep a watch for the word subcutaneous emphysema or crepitus below the skin which emphasizes the air leak that is occurring secondary to Boerhaave syndrome. Also, there is a distinct possibility that in some questions, he could describe a pregnant lady. In the first trimester, she is having excessive vomiting and then the same profile can happen. Mallory VS can happen and even Boerhaave can be a possibility. I have explained in detail hematochesia per se. The number one cause from exam perspective is diverticulitis. And in fact, because he knows this is an answer, he will ask you what is the imaging modality. So there, uh, your answer would be CT scan and not a barium enema. If he specifies regarding malena in a person, then the number one cause for malena is peptic ulcer disease. And that is where upper G endoscopy would be done. Apart from this, I've also highlighted regarding situations where angiography would be used like angiodysplasia of the colon and even a hemobilia. I have highlighted these statements once again in a single box so that you are able to have a permanent imprint of this in your brain so that every time you read the cues or the hints that are given in the questions, you should be able to come to the answer spot on. There is also a possibility that in some questions, he would try to introduce aspects from pediatrics. Now, I'm trying to make the discussion as broad as possible because if he's going to be talking about fresh blood in the stool in a child, then in those circumstances, we need to first answer as rectal polyp. I know the fact that a lot of you will say that, sir, why is it not Meikle's diverticulum? I'm just simply following the data that is given in Harrison where is mentioned both of them. You see, rectal polyp is anyway mentioned in, in surgery book. That is, uh, uh, in Bailey and Love, rectal polyp is given first. But even in Harrison, though both of them are given because first rectal polyp is written, so I would suggest you to give that as an answer. Meckel's diverticulum per se is always going to follow the rule of two. That's relatively easy to comprehend. Uh, I'll just mention embryological details here also. You are aware that this structure is a remnant of vital intestinal duct and lots of time it might be detected incidentally. How incidentally the person under was undergoing appendicitis surgery like he was having right iliac fossa pain so because there was tenderness in the right iliac fossa the surgeon decided to operate on this guy but uh, when he evaluated the appendix maybe the appendix was normal and actually it was uh, the meckles that was causing manifestation so lots of time meckles might be an intraoperative finding as well this is a remnant of the vito intestinal duct it will always be located on the anti mesenteric border so there have been situations where he is given a specimen in the exam and the picture was very clear. I mean, you could see the mesentery. You could, if this is the bubble, you could see the mesentery. And then on the anti mesenteric border, this structure was present. The size is going to be 2 inches, 2 feet from the ileocecal junction. So anyway, can be easily identified. Let us recap the features of rule of two just for the sake of completion. It can be present in 2% of population. If a question says what is the usual presentation of Meckel's diverticulum, it is asymptomatic. It is only if it will bleed that it will contribute to manifestations. And why would it bleed is primarily because it could be having tube mucosas. 
इट कुड इधर भी स्टमक म्यूकोजा इट कुड भी पैंक्रेटिक म्यूकोजा सो द स्टमक म्यूकोजा प्रोड्यूस एसिड और पैंक्रेटिक म्यूकोजा वुड प्रोड्यूस अल्कली सो दैट विल कॉज इरोजन और डैमेज एंड दैट कैन कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट टू द ब्लीडिंग प्रोफाइल इट इज टू इंचज इन साइज इट इज टू फीट फ्रॉम द इलियोसिकल जंक्शन दैट्स वेरी स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड डेटा दैट आई थिंक ऑल ऑफ यू आर फैमिलियर विद द two that i find most people forgetting is the two mucosas that are seen and while i'm writing it please tell me the imaging modality of choice for this condition the commonest presentation of this condition is asymptomatic 98% patients are asymptomatic only 2% will turn symptomatic and they would be having or the question would say child having passage of maroon color stool now whenever you read a question regarding a infant passing blood in the stool you always have to keep in mind intussusception as well intussusception is anyway something that you have to be very thorough about from the surgical domain but what i am saying is that in this case he will write the word maroon color stool in a asymptomatic child or he will just say that this child was complaining of diffuse abdominal pain you see intussusception per se will be causing pain so bad that the child will be crying very loudly but in this case there is a distinct possibility that the child will be having limited symptoms but it was a maroon color stool which brought the mother bring the child over to the hospital the investigation choice for this particular condition would be answered as technetium 99 pulp technet scan do take care of the fact that technetium 99 scan plain that is systemic scan has been taught for parathyroid adenoma and even in chronic stable angina but today we not talking about plain technetium 99 it is technetium 99 pulp technet scan that would be useful for diagnosis and then subsequently we will go for a resection of this lesion the third important cause is intussusception why does intussusception occur in infants is due to the enlargement of the pears patches because you giving cereals to children that would cause antigenic stimulus so the pears patches will become bigger and those pears patches can cause one part of the intestine to herniate into another so intussusception is anyway to be kept in mind and one of the highlights of this would be the term excessive cry in a child with a red currant jelly stool the type of intussusception that occurs in adults mainly is colocolic that would occur secondary to polyps but in children the lead point is mainly the pears patches which tend to become relatively bigger and this word red currant jelly stool will make the diagnosis relatively easier for you because lump in the right leg fossa of a child who's having a iliocolic uh, intussusception might be actually difficult to pick up especially if the child is crying the abdominal wall becomes very tense so being able to feel a lump in a crying child is going to require a lot of experience so most of the time it would be missed so this one hint red currant jelly stool will definitely do the trick for you and more details of intussusception including the management are to be read from sir I have just highlighted the pediatric domain because lots of time I have seen that they talk about eye internal medicine component. People are able to answer, so they mix up in the same question. And that is in the question of hematochezia, he could be incorporating multiple diseases and might like to ask about them simultaneously. A twist in the MCQ was that he described a neonate with hematochezia. Now that again looks very surprising because you see intussusception will usually occur after the age of six months where when you start introducing complementary feeding, you start introducing cereals in the child. It is very rare to have intussusception at maybe in a newborn age group. So neonate with hematochezia, the scenario given was that this was a home delivery, and unfortunately the mother had postpartum hemorrhage. and the mother expired because of this it was a home delivery asha worker was assisting and this grand multipara she had a gush of bleeding and then her bp became unrecordable she became cold limp they put her in a three wheeler auto brought to your hospital as you know half the time these 1091 and all these numbers don't work ambulances don't reach so they brought her in a three wheeler auto to your hospital almost lifeless and you had to declare that she is died she died at home due to pph now since the mother has expired it is the grandmother who is taking care of this little newborn baby and uh, what this grandmother did was she gave cow's milk to the baby you see cow's milk is for a cow's baby not not for a human baby if you give cow's milk to a human baby cow's milk will be containing proteins like lactoglobulin which are very difficult to digest when you are giving cow's milk to a baby that is when this child this newborn baby started having fresh blood in the stool this presentation that i have written before you is that of nec that is necrotizing enterocolitis so do take care of the age group of presentation as well because when i'm talking about a infant it was either a 
interception or it could be a rectal polyp. Rectal polyp per se will be causing no symptoms at all. It would just bleed. So the data on basis of prevalence is first rectal polyp, then mecals and interception is anywhere to be kept in mind when he talks about especially an infant six to nine months of age with the word red currant jelly stool written. For necrotizing anterior colitis, I also want you to read more in detail from pediatrics regarding bell staging. And one very characteristic manifestation that comes here is, and I'm just drawing it the way it will become easier for you to comprehend. You see, there can be erosion of the mucosa and the submucosa. You have air present in the lumen of the gut. Air is in the lumen of the gut, but now air is going into the submucosa. I mean, look at the surprising thing I'm telling you. Air is present in the lumen of the gut, but I'm not talking about air going into the submucosa area because there's an erosion present. This description that I've just given you right now is asked very frequently in pediatrics and is called as pneumatosis intestinalis. As you can see from the name, pneumostasis intestinalis highlights that there is going to be air present in the wall of the intestine. Mark my words, they're not in the lumen. Lumen, it already air is there. It is in the wall of the intestine that he's talking about. So uh, necrotizing enterocolitis from the pediatric perspective and unit perspective is also to be kept in mind. I dedicated these slides uh, to the revision part and a bit of additional information coming to the subsequent part of our discussion i'll now be explaining to you esophageal disorders i'm now showing the esophageal musculature from the posterior respect i've shown muscle fibers in blue which are arranged obliquely versus the circular arrangement of the fibers in green so let me give them names here the muscle fibers which have been shown in color blue is the inferior constrictor muscle you can contrast the arrangement of the muscle fibers with the ones that are shown in color green, which is cricopharyngeus. You can also notice that at the junction of the two, there is a defect present and it is from this defect that a outpouching can develop, which is called as zincar diverticulum. You will notice that right at the bottom, the one in purple that I've shown is the smooth muscle. And again, there is a defect present here from where they can be a zincar diverticulum developing. In the exam, the examiner would love to ask you regarding this particular area that I'm marking out in dotted red now. This is an area where muscle fibers are not there. There's only fascia present, so Zenker's reverticulum can develop. So they will ask you the name of this triangle which I've highlighted. Most guys are able to answer this correctly as Killian triangle. But I find that the same brilliant chaps sometimes are not able to answer for the triangle that I'm putting a sky blue star mark at the moment this triangle which is marked inferiorly is what is called as limer's triangle so get my statement right killian's triangle and limer's triangle are anatomical weaknesses from where zinker's diverticulum can develop as you can see in this image also zinker's diverticulum is posteriorly situated and the area where it is going to be located will be at the junction of the circular fibers of cricopharyngeus and the oblique fibers of the inferior constrictor muscle now what are the problems that will be anticipated there would be definitely some food that will impact in this area and this food will keep on rotting and that is why the person would come to you with symptoms of halitosis that would be bad breath most of the time the mcqs on this particular topic will talk about a old person a geriatric age group presentation is usually seen with zinker's diverticulum because we are talking about an old man so you always need to keep a watch whether this could be a carcinoma esophagus as well because even in carcinoma esophagus because the there would be a fungating growth it will narrow down the lumen of the esophagus so food impaction food retention can occur and because of that when the food will keep on rotting again the halitosis component can come in please remember the fact that when you read a question that begins by saying halitosis regurgitation of yesterday's food items do not be under impression that this is a standard feature only with zincar diverticulum even a cancer having a fungating growth and causing a substantial luminal obstruction can cause similar kind of symptoms the disease that i'm explaining to you here is zincar's diverticulum the highlight of this condition will be that it would be a geriatric age group patient I want you to understand that even cancer can occur in relatively old age groups. So mixing up the two disorders that is cancer of the esophagus and zincar diverticulum is a possibility. I want to highlight the fact that in cancer, the fungating growth of the esophagus can be substantial enough to cause obstructive symptoms. So regurgitation of yesterday's food items can also be written in a question related to malignancy 
and that basically means that how in a question would you differentiate on clinical grounds whether he's talking about zinker or whether he's talking about uh, esophageal cancer well i want you to remember that in zinker's diverticulum the symptoms are not gonna dramatically increase unlike a cancer which will keep on increasing in size so in six months eight months nine months the cancer is becoming bigger so there is a progressive dysphagia whereas when it comes to zinker diverticulum the size is almost gonna remain the same so this will always talk about non-progressive dysphagia do remember my statements which I have highlighted here, progressive dysphagia with cachexia is a feature with cancer. But when you talk about non-progressive dysphagia along with the symptoms written on the top, it is zincers which has to be kept in mind. The most common site where zincer diverticulum is located has already been discussed. That is Killian triangle. You read about that even in ENT, even in surgery. So I think that's you are comfortable with that. The investigational choice for this condition is a barium swallow. For management of this condition, it is surgical resection of this diverticulum which is to be done. Most of the time, errors can occur with respect to this topic only if you don't read the question carefully because as I've highlighted, if it is progressive dysphagia, you need to give first differential diagnosis as cancer of the esophagus. Because I spoke about dysphagia at this particular scenario, I also want to put up a question here which said that dysphagia will occur when how much percentage of luminal obstruction the esophagus will occur. Like let us assume this is the esophagus and then there is a fungating mass of a esophageal cancer and now it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and is causing substantial luminal obstruction. So at how much of percentage of obstruction will the person tell you that I feel as if the food is sticking behind my chest bone. So remember at least 66%. If there is more than two thirds of luminal obstruction occurring, that is the time when dysphagia symptom will develop. This was number or a value based question like he gave options like 30%, 50% like that. But this has some logical interpretation in a sense that dysphagia will usually develop in esophageal disorders very late. Imagine the cancer is so big that it is causing 66% obstruction. That is when the person will say that I feel something like a food sticking behind my chest bone or I feel as if the food is not going down. So you need to have a high index of suspicion in any patient having difficulty in swallowing. You must, especially in geriatric age group, keep in mind a possibility of a malignancy as you will see in the subsequent discussions and the subsequent subtopics that I discuss with you. Whenever esophagus will have peristalsis, the peristaltic wave will move in a forward fashion so that when one part of the esophagus is contracting, the subsequent part will be relaxing. Once the food will reach the lower one third of the esophagus, then we have the lower esophagus sphincter, which is ha having a resting tone. In fact, uh, the question to you guys at the moment, because this is an overlap from surgery, is what is the resting tone of the sphincter? You see, with how much pressure should the lower part of the esophagus contract so that the food passes into the stomach? Then the tone of the sphincter is a range. It is 15 to 25 millimeters of mercury. And once it contracts, I mean, the lower part of the esophagus contracts a substantial force more than this one. That is when it will open and the food will go into the stomach. We have a peristaltic wave going up. And therefore, the food can easily pass into the lower part of the esophagus. But now I'm showing a condition where whole of the esophagus is contracted in a single go. Please appreciate that unlike the previous diagram, this time I'm showing that the upper part and the middle part and the lower part, whole of the esophagus is contracting simultaneously. Well, the condition that I'm introducing now after zincer diverticulum is called as diffuse esophageal spasm. In this condition, the main symptom of the patient will not be dysphagia. Will not be dysphagia. Why? Because you see blood vessels, the one that I'm showing in red are the blood vessels of the esophagus. The blood vessels of the esophagus traverse through the muscles only. In this condition, because whole of the esophagus will contract with force, the force will constrict the esophageal blood vessels. And now I have shown these blood vessels constricted, which explains why this condition will be called as esophageal angina. And therefore, the symptoms that are encountered in a patient of diffuse esophageal spasm, the first one is not dysphagia. It is chest pain, which will make you think that he's having a cardiac issue. And you will refer this guy to a cardiologist for ECG or maybe a treadmill test or workup of chronic stable angina or blockages in the coronary artery will be done. 
but in the end the report will come out to be normal because the problem is not in the coronary circulation the problem is in the esophagus of this chap so we need to have a high index of suspicion for this condition why because if you are having chest pain persisting in a guy and the cardiology department has said no cardiologic issue ECG is normal, stress echo is normal, coronary angiography is normal in this guy and still there is development of chest pain, then you need to think in terms of this being a non-cardiac cause of chest pain. The usual complaints of these patients is chest pain at rest. How would you differentiate this chest pain at rest from that of MIE? In myocardial infarction, the chest pain will be occurring on a continuous basis with sweating, pulmonary edema manifestations. Here the chest pain will be occurring on an intermittent basis. Please remember the fact that most of the time when you rule out the cardiac causes in these patients, that is when these patients realize their second symptoms. Because initially if somebody is having chest pain, I'll put it on myself. If I have chest pain, first thought process of mine is something is wrong with the blood vessels of my heart. I'll go and see a cardiologist. But once you tell this guy nothing wrong with the coronary circulation, that is when he will realize a subsequent symptom. Because chest pain per se is such a predominant symptom that a person will not be able to appreciate the dysphagia component. It is intermittent chest pain which is present in this condition though that's very subjective but there will be no evidence of any diaphoresis, breathlessness, pink frothy sputum or pulmonary edema findings that I've discussed in the cardiac part. Uh, I mean as such because this is not a cardiac condition so evidence of pulmonary edema or sympathomimetic stimulation will not be present. Well why does diffuse esophageal spasm occur? It is idiopathic. It is a idiopathic condition which is contributing these manifestations now how do you evaluate that this is diffuse esophageal spasm i said this is a diagnosis of exclusion always rule out coronary artery disease by doing if possible a treadmill test if he can't walk like an obese person you can do a stress echo and a baseline ecg will obviously be done on the first presentation with maybe cardiac biomarkers to rule out the coronary etiology if he says what is the investigational choice for this condition, your answer will be given as esophageal manometry. You see lots of times surgeons love to talk about barium swallow. I will talk about barium swallow findings in this person as well but I want you to appreciate that the best evidence of diffuse esophageal spasm is to record the pressures in the esophagus. Here they would ask you that the pressure of the esophagus will be more than how much to call it diffuse esophageal spasm. So if the pressure recorded is more than 120 millimeter of mercury, you see the systolic blood pressure is 120. If esophagus will contract with a force more than 120, that is when it will constrict its own blood supply and that is why we call this condition also as esophageal angina. In fact, lots of time in the exam, the way they will give the question, you will be tempted to answer it as chronic stable angina coronary artery disease. But please appreciate the fact that in chronic stable angina also the symptoms of chest pain come on exercise. Here is having symptoms at rest and as such the cardiac profile is normal. If you record on manometry, the pressure is more than 120 millimeters of mercury for more than 3 seconds. We will call it diffuse esophageal spasm. Then there is a variant of this. The variant of this is called as nutcracker esophagus where the pressures recorded will be even much much higher if the pressures the intraluminal pressures are turning out to be more than 180 millimeters of mercury for more than 6.5 seconds or a little more than that that is when you will use the term nutcracker esophagus well you see our examiners have this habit of asking values also so here i would definitely like you to get these pressures right do remember two numbers 120 and 180 and durations are three seconds and more than 6.5 seconds when it comes to diffuse esophageal spasm they can also give you a barium swallow finding which is very characteristic and easy to identify i mean i have never seen anybody missing up this particular finding Unless and until somebody is reckless or casual, as you can see, very particular manifestation of nutcracker esophagus can be seen. The radiologist will love to hear use the following terms. Either he will use the word cork screw esophagus or he might say the word rosary bead appearance. Both of these are surrogate terminologies which basically highlight that well there is a problem with the contraction part and whole of the esophagus is contracting in a single go. Couple of guys have casually answered this as esophageal candidiasis. You see in esophageal candidiasis, the appearance will be slightly different. So let me just show you another image in which the appearance of the esophagus of the patient is slightly different. 
if you compare this with the contralateral image that I've just highlighted on the screen at the moment, you will notice that there is a very irregular margins. You see, there's no rosary bead. It's very irregular margin. So I would just like to call or use the term shaggy appearance of the esophagus. This shaggy appearance is what is seen with esophageal candidiasis. In fact, in the question, he can also give you risk factors for esophageal candida. Obviously, AIDS is one of them. I have explained that in the AIDS section that uh, oral candidiasis is not uh, going to be uh, making you suspect AIDS. But if a person is having invasive candidiasis, that is esophageal or bronchus or lungs getting involved, that is where you will think in terms of possibility of AIDS. And apart from AIDS, another important risk factor can be an asthmatic ticking inhaled corticosteroids. I repeat the statement once again, asthmatics, if they're taking ICS and they're not doing a rinsing of the mouth, because you see, when you take a puffer, lots of time the drug might be deposited in the pharynx only. And that is where there's a possibility that the infection can go down also and can involve the esophagus. So if it gives you a scenario of an immunocompromised person like AIDS, that would be easy. Or a person who's an asthmatic and is on inhaled corticosteroids, then this irregular appearance or shaggy margins are what is in favor of esophageal candida. Whereas you can notice very clear indentations, which will help you identify the corkscrew appearance. So I personally feel that there is no reason why the two conditions can ever be missed. Now we will come to the treatment part of diffuse esophageal spasm. Here I want you to remember that rather the drugs which have shown improvement in the general condition of this patient is not nitrates or calcium channel blockers. In Harrison, he has mentioned that in trials, it is anxiolytics that have an important role. Why I can explain like this, you know, if I'm having chest pain, my first thought process would be I'm having a heart problem. Even if you reassure me, no, your angiography is normal, your ECG is normal, I might doubt you. I might doubt your diagnostic acumen. I might say, oh, this doctor is not very qualified. He is telling me I'm having chest pain. He's saying no cardiac problem. You see, patient will have his own thought process also. So anxiety is something which can contribute to worsening of this condition. So anxiolytics have had the best role in management of this condition and because you know that anxiolytics can be habit forming like if you're giving clonazepam 0.25 the person will develop a habit of using it and then subsequently will also be having sedation so a non-sedating non-sedating non-habit forming anxiolytic that you are aware is bispiron which can be used in this condition if he says what drug will relieve the chest pain, then the controversy is between nitrates and calcium channel blockers. I want you to appreciate that nitrates are first to be answered because per se for chest pain, the first drug always used is nitrates. The nitrate that I'm going to use in this case, however, is not a short acting one. I'm not going to use nitroglycerin. I'll have to use it again and again plus side effect, a headache and other side effects can also come like edema. It is long acting nitrates that would be recommended. That is isosorbide mononitrate for these patients. Along with this, calcium channel blockers are to be answered. I basically wanted to highlight the fact that most guys begin by discussing calcium channel blockers or nitrates as the primary treatment of this condition. But actually, if you look at the efficacy of the drugs, everything that I'm going to tell you is in decreasing order of importance. It is anxiolytics, then it's going to be nitrates, then it's going to be calcium channel blocker. You can use a long acting one like amlodipine, which will reduce the distress of this patient. Coming to HLSA cardia, the first question that comes up is why would it be developing? Well, one of the important causes from the South American perspective can be Chagas disease. Most guys can answer that very easily. Chagas disease is uh, transmitted by a reduvid bug. The organism, as you are aware, is Trapanosoma cruzi. And uh, well, this disease is more common in South America. So can you think of a relatively more common cause than Chagas disease? The number one cause for HLSA cardia should be answered as autoimmunity. I have seen most guys casually answer idiopathic, which is not the case. Then it can be a paraneoplastic manifestation with the lung cancer. Well, this lung cancer is famous for causing paraneoplastic manifestations. Oat cell cancer has been discussed to contribute to SIADH, which will cause dilutional hyponatremia. It can also contribute to ectopic ACTH production resulting in Cushing syndrome manifestations. Micromets are anyway there. Even it can contribute to neurological manifestations which is called as Lambert-Eaton syndrome. So oat cell cancer has come up for the fourth time after discussing the standard ones like SIADH and the ones that I've highlighted. Even HLSA cardia has been documented. 
In fact, they have highlighted that in this condition, there are some antibodies produced by this nasty lung cancer called as anti hu antibodies. And these antibodies then go and damage the airbag plexus and they affect the motility of the esophagus contributing to this disorder. Now, what actually is the main problem in this guy? I mean, you can definitely see on the monitor at the moment, the bird beak appearance of a barium swallow. But I want to again highlight that the investigational choice for this condition is not a barium swallow. The investigational choice for this condition is again esophageal manometry. Now we have studied why is it occurring. Now we will talk about the pathogenesis component of the disease that what actually happens. Why do you have HLSA cardia? Why do you have this constriction? The first answer of yours in this motility disorder will be that this condition causes a peristalsis that is the lower one third of the esophagus specifically does not exhibit routine peristaltic waves. The second problem in this patient is more surprising in fact that there is an increase in the lower esophageal sphincter tone and the usual query that I get from my students is how is that possible it's causing local damage so it's going to cause a decrease in tone. Well you are aware that for motility of the esophagus we have airbag plexus we have a mind track plexus in this particular case what happens is that the inhibitory control is lost so this contributes to increase in the tone of the sphincter the sphincter will become more difficult to open which means the fact that when this person will eat food, the food will keep on accumulating in the esophagus. It would go down into the stomach because the sphincter is tightly closed. Now this person will drink a full glass of water. Now the weight of the water in the food due to gravity will be more than the tone of the sphincter and the food will then trickle down into the stomach of the patient. And once the weight reduces, well, the sphincter closes again and uh, therefore there would be some food and some water always left behind. I want to highlight that in you and me, whether you're drinking water, you're taking semi-solid food, whether you're taking solid food, everything goes from the esophagus directly into the stomach. Not a single drop of water remains behind. In this condition, the food will not go down because the sphincter is very tightly closed. So let's look at the clinical features that will evolve in this condition. Most of the time, autoimmune disorders are more common in young females. He will describe progressive dysphagia. The autoimmunity part keeps on worsening the disease presentation of this person. If I was talking about progressive dysphagia in a geriatric age population, first to be thought of is cancer always. Now, as I said, food is not going to go down. It would remain behind in the esophagus. So there could be rotting of food and water contributing to halitosis. There would be regurgitation of yesterday's food items. I have highlighted this for the second time today that regurgitation of yesterday food items is a feature that you see both with Zenker diverticulum as well as will HLSA cardia. But the difference is very well obvious on the slide before you. This time you are not going to think in terms of Zenker because we are talking about progressive dysphagia developing in a person. Lots of time he might even help you by writing dysphagia more for liquids as compared to solids. Now why is that so is a common query from lot of students. So I would like to explain that you see liquids are lighter. So the weight of the liquid may not be sufficient to open the sphincter. So he might have to drink lots and lots of water and then it will cause the weight of the water to be substantial that the sphincter relaxes and the food goes down or the water goes down. But if you compare liquid versus solid, solid is heavier. So still the weight of solid will be more. It will be able to open the sphincter and the food will go down relatively better. So on a comparison basis, though, I would like to highlight all patients are not so intelligent enough to say this statement that I have more problems with liquids as compared to solids. But this is a useful MCQ tip which is present. And even if it is not given, you should still be able to identify the question based on the gender part, on the young age group of the patient. And because progressive dysphagia is given, so Zenker's diverticulum is off the radar. Since the food remains in the esophagus, there could even be aspiration episodes developing. I'm not talking about a huge big aspiration like Mendelssohn syndrome. I'm talking about micro aspiration that can occur when these people are sleeping. So therefore you will read about recurrent pneumonia episodes developing in these patients. This is definitely bad news because this can contribute to the mortality component in these patients also because if it's recurrent pneumonia episodes, even bronchitis and serious lung disease manifestations can occur. The investigational choice for this condition should be answered as esophageal manometry where the tone of the sphincter will be found to be more than 25 millimeter of mercury. We all have a bias towards answering barium swallow because we see lot of images of barium swallow in the textbooks and even surgeons love to show lot of such images which are very classical ones from standard textbooks. So this bias can come. When it comes to a barium swallow finding of this patient, the main finding that you will encounter will be a bird beak uh, defect which can be confused with the rat tail also 
I'll uh, try to explain to you how both can be differentiated. Do remember the fact that bird beak versus pencil tape, they both imply the same. In a few seconds from now, I'll explain to you how to differentiate with, from a rat tail appearance. Please remember the fact that the treatment of choice for HLSA cardia would be answered as Heller's myotomy. And because uh, this myotomy procedure is done, they could definitely be a reflux developing in the form of GRD in the patient. So to prevent that from happening, we will also have to go in for a second procedure that is partial fundoplication. So this is taught in surgery also. The treatment of choice is Heller's myotomy with partial fundoplication. However, if a person is not willing for surgery or is a high risk patient for surgery in a sense that this lady is having some concomitant comorbidities, the person has refused or the anesthesiologist has refused surgery. In those circumstances, botulinum toxin injection can be given in the lower part of the esophagus. That will again help in relaxation of the tight sphincter as well as the aperistaltic segment will tend to relax a bit because the inhibitory control now is lost. Apart from botulinum toxin, drug support can also be used. If the person has refused everything that I have written on the board, then even calcium channel blockers can be used. But don't answer nitrates. Nitrates are mainly answered for diffuse esophageal spasm. Here, I want to highlight two diagrams simultaneously. In one of them, you can definitely notice a very classical bird beak or a pencil tip appearance. But in the second one, you will notice that there is an irregular filling defect that is present. So the key word is, you see, the word rat tail versus pencil tape is disputed because both are having, you know, English nomenclature being used. For we as doctors, we need to mainly remember the word irregular filling defect versus the regular filling defect. In fact, sometimes in MCQs, he might even use the word shouldering sign. So when it comes to a cancer, it is always to be thought of a malignancy though obviously the best way for diagnosis of malignancy is endoscopy with a biopsy you get a tissue diagnosis also but shouldering sign irregular filling defect both of them they point towards etiology of carcinoma esophagus the commonest one is squamous cell cancer cancer in lower one third is obviously esophageal cancer is adenocarcinoma but overall is squamous cell cancer on the right hand side it's a regular filling defect of hlysia cardia now look at the twist in the question that can come so please be very attentive in the next two minutes the question began in the exam by describing a 25 year old female. He also described that this lady is having progressive dysphagia. The standard features that I've told even for HLS cardia were given in the question. However, subsequently, he modulated the question by saying that esophageal manometry when performed revealed that the tone of the sphincter is reduced. Now that is the surprising part that I'm saying that in HLS cardia, the tone of the sphincter was more here. He said reduced. You need to pick up this question and answer the diagnosis as scleroderma. You see, if you focus on the word scleroderma, well, there is sclerosis or fibrosis in the skin. It can involve even the sphincter. Though in the MCQ, he also mentioned a lot of other subtle hints. Like for diagnosis of scleroderma, he will always talk about leather-like skin appreciated in a person. Or he can talk about early manifestations like Renaud's phenomenon. He can definitely make this question relatively long by showing a multi-system involvement which will cause you to waste your time. He can also talk about scleroderma crisis because the kidneys will shrink in size so person can go into hypertensive crisis. He will not write the word scleroderma crisis, then you know the diagnosis. He will try to explain a person having high blood pressure with Reynolds phenomenon, with leather-like skin, with progressive dysphagia, with a decrease in the tone. And in the maze of so much information provided, we tend to lose focus on the keywords that have highlighted with a different ink here. The tone of the center is lesser. In these circumstances, the current diagnosis of this person is scleroderma. And now for diagnosis of scleroderma per se, I will not be doing a manometry. Manometry report is already given to me in the question. Tone of the center less means manometry report is given, no? So you will not answer manometry in this question, which couple of people casually answered because tone of the sphincter was given. They said manometry. The point is for diagnosis of scleroderma, you need to run an antibody scan that is going to be anti-topoisomerase antibody. I have discussed scleroderma in rheumatology section also, but I want to highlight this statement of mine. When you read a question of a geriatric age group person with non-progressive dysphagia, you have to think in terms of zinker. If it is old man with progressive dysphagia, you need to think in terms of a cancer. If you talk about a young female, two differentials. 
it could be scleroderma it could be hls cardia what is the differentiating feature the differentiating feature is the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter it's going to be upregulated or increased in hls cardia it's going to be down in the dumps in scleroderma because there, there's definitely a significant significant fibrosis occurring in the wall of the esophagus that's why you read about esophageal dysmotility even in the literature of scleroderma as well I would like to now summarize the topic of dysphagia. I would like to subdivide the discussion into two parts. One can be oropharyngeal causes and second can be esophageal disorders which can explain the symptom. For the oropharyngeal component, one can be structural defects. One of the common structural aspects that I have highlighted is Zenker diverticulum which was having non-progressive dysphagia but you also need to keep in your mind regarding neoplasm which will be having a progressive manifestation. Apart from this, Another structural cause which I am mentioning right now is a upper esophageal web. In fact, you guessed it right, I am talking about plumber Vinson syndrome. In majority of MCQs of plumber Vinson syndrome, the term upper esophageal web may not be written and he will write the word post cricoid dysphagia. Along with this, iron deficiency anemia and coelioanchia would be describing the triad. I can also raise a controversy here which is that in some books the triad of plumber vinson syndrome rather incorporates the term glossitis whereas i have not spoken about it i want to highlight that in major gastroenterology books and even in harrison he is mainly mentioned about these three the glossitis component is not mentioned in harrison so i would like to take that as a reference for plumber vinson formerly called as patterson kelly syndrome now not only structural there can be neurogenic causes also Neurogenic causes of oropharyngeal dysphagia where the person will say that the food sticks in the throat not in the chest but in the throat could be due to cerebrovascular accident and I can then talk about a disease of the neuromuscular junction I'm writing the word myopathic because muscles are not working properly but it's actually a disease of neuromuscular junction that is myasthenia gravis and even in lambert eaton syndrome in some cases dysphagia can be described so we definitely need to avoid that bias that only the specific esophageal disorders that we have discussed are the ones which are responsible in fact oropharyngeal always have to be ruled out first before we start thinking in terms of what we have discussed as standard esophageal disorders contributing to development of dysphagia here i also want to highlight a condition where a person is told not to eat non-veg you will tell this guy, sir, veg you can eat even if you want to eat chicken or meat or non-vegetarian items. They should be minced properly. Can you think of a medical condition related to esophagus lower one third where you have specifically told your patient not to eat non-vegetarian food? I'm very sure all of you in surgery have read regarding Schatzky's ring. Please remember upper esophageal web I was speaking about. That's upper esophagus but Schatzky's ring is found in the lower one third of the esophagus. The highlight of this condition is meat impaction. Do remember the fact that Schatzky's ring is not a pre-malignant condition. It's just a malformation that will contribute to dysphagia in the patient. In fact, uh, due to meat impaction, these people can even develop aphagia and then a possible esophageal perforation as well. That's an important cause which is to be remembered from the exam perspective. Though there are many others that I've highlighted before you, but these are additional aspects that I have tried to highlight. I've talked about the triad of plumber Vinson. I've talked about meat impaction, which are two important issues. You see, actually, there's a table in Harrison where all these causes are explained. But instead of trying to, you know, just mark it on the table like tick mark, these are the causes. I've tried to highlight the important ones. Like if I just zoom into the table, you can see one of the structural issues that he has always talked about is Zenker diverticulum and a neoplasm. And when it comes to a neurogenic cause, one of the important causes to be considered is cerebrovascular accident, though even Parkinsonism and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis can be having issues with feeding and the topics are definitely covered in neurology. So I want to highlight the fact that do not be under impression that all questions that will come to you will be of esophageal dysphagia because when you read the word dysphagia, the impression is about the diseases that we have studied. I want you to have a broader whole, whole perspective. Like for example, if a question begins by a young female and he says that this lady is having difficulty in eating his breakfast or let me say this lady is able to finish her meal over a long duration. She eats very slowly and if she tries to gulp milk fast, she literally chokes on it. The disease that you're thinking here is a disease related to the voluntary aspect of swallowing. You see the tongue has become slow. Person is not able to gulp milk or it takes her long to finish the food. She is first one on the dining table, last to get off it. I'm talking about myasthenia gravis.
in maestra gravis because maestra gravis is not a disease of the smooth muscles maestra gravis is a disease of the skeletal muscles so it is the voluntary component of swallowing that will be affected there but still the question will specify the word oropharyngeal dysphagia where the person will specifically mention that when i try to drink milk fast i feel as if it is stuck in my throat or as if i'm choking on milk so when you read about dysphagia as a symptom think in the exam is he talking about a oropharyngeal aspect or is he talking about the standard esophageal disorders which are i think relatively easy i mean you guys are smart chaps so esophageal disorders you will not have a problem with but even the myopathic component or the neurogenic component that i have highlighted should also be kept in mind i will now discuss two cases with you before i discuss barrett's esophagus subsequently and gastroesophageal reflux disease i want to highlight the fact that lot of questions that are coming nowadays can be actually a overlap between medicine and surgery so that is why i have to discuss two more topics here but in the form of questions i'm describing this 30 year old guy he is alcoholic like he works in a call center good salary so well if somebody starts earning money people tend to spend it on booze so this guy has gone to a club with his friends and they've ordered you know multiple pints of beer and they he is doing binge drinking and uh, following that he starts having a vomiting also so his friend or maybe he went with his girlfriend and he and his girlfriend are drinking themselves silly so maybe a friend or anybody is accompanying him into the washroom and uh, he's having retching now like he has vomited so much that whatever he had eaten snacks non veg etc everything is out now the stomach is empty but the retching sound is being produced and he pukes and then he starts experiencing severe chest pain and uh, crushes on the bathroom floor syncope so his girlfriend is panicky or his friend is panicky and they are brought to the hospital by the by the restaurant staff they escort them to the hospital or in the ambulance is brought to the hospital where when you are doing a physical examination of this patient you are noticing that he is having puffiness of his eyes this puffiness of the eyes is because he is having subcutaneous emphysema or he might say crepitus below the skin you see when i say this statement you are very comfortable with the fact that i am not discussing mallory vs because in mallory vs there was no subcutaneous emphysema the question will waste your time with the vitals also it would be like a heart rate of 120 per minute it could be a blood pressure value which is on the lower side let me say only 90 by 60 mm of mercury why because this guy is having pneumomediastinum and because of this pneumomediastinum component the air would uh, press on the great veins like svc ivc so the venous return on the heart can definitely be compromised well at this point of time i want to highlight regarding the following aspects this guy is puking vomiting there is chest pain in this guy there is a subcutaneous emphysema so i'm talking about macular stride in this condition which will help you in making the final diagnosis in fact sometimes it could be a two step question he knows the fact that you are definitely smart enough to answer boyrav syndrome right away the moment you read these features he will ask you how would you work it up i want to highlight the fact that boyer's esophagus would be a tear it would be a through and through rupture of the esophagus causing spilling of the contents of the esophagus into the mediastinum why was he having a chest pain the reason for chest pain in this guy the reason for chest pain in this patient is chemical mediastinitis you see esophagus does not have nerves no that it will through and through rupture and person will have chest pain it is chemical mediastinitis it is saliva it is the food the alcohol that has now come into the mediastinal cavity of this patient when the esophagus through and through ruptured and mostly this occurs in the lower one third of the esophagus posteriorly because esophagus is weakest posteriorly the chest pain of this chap is explained by chemical mediastinitis it is usually the lower one third of the esophagus that will be affected why i repeated that lower esophagus thing is because i want to tell you that suppose a person is undergoing a upper ge endoscopy that is instrumentation of the esophagus is occurring you are familiar with the fact that whenever you read a question regarding instrumentation of the esophagus and a rupture of the esophagus or a tear of the esophagus it is the cervical esophagus the upper part that would be affected so do take care of this fact that you read about boyer's syndrome with instrumentation and also with respect to what i have described well alcoholics having recurrent vomiting you see it could be mallory vs it could be uh, macular stride or boyer's syndrome so you need to keep a watch up for that now i come to the main agenda why i am talking about it he will rather not ask you the diagnosis but will say what is the main test for diagnosis of this condition you see if you will be doing a x ray chest in this guy you will definitely be able to get a continuous diaphragm sign 
that's a standard radiological finding of pneumomedia sternum. But the point is you need to demonstrate the tear. You need to demonstrate the chemical mediastinitis component. So you will be doing a CT chest of this guy. And next what I say will sound controversial to you. But it is not controversial because this is what Harrison says. CT, CT chest with oral contrast. When I say this, a lot of guys will say, Sir, barium, you are giving him orally. There's a tear. It will go in the mediastinal cavity. Won't that cause worsening of chemical mediastinitis? So I'm going to be smart. I'm not going to use barium in this case. I'm rather going to use a gastrocaffeine contrast. I want to highlight the fact that for these particular patients, it is not plain CT. It is CT with a water-soluble gastrographin contrast which can be given because you need to demonstrate the spillage of the contents into the mediastinum to demonstrate a through and through perforation. You see, please appreciate, tear can be partial thickness, tear can be full thickness. Suppose serosa is intact. If serosa is intact in this guy, then in those circumstances, there would be no chemical mediastinitis occurring. But if there is a tear of the serosa, then chemical mediastinitis will definitely occur. So I need to demonstrate that the serosa is gone. And now the contents are spilled over into the mediastinal cavity. So a CT with oral contrast followed by obviously a surgical repair of this patient will be done. And concomitant even a pneumomediastinum can be present in this patient. Continuous diaphragm sign per se will be air above the level of the diaphragm. You see gas will the diaphragm is a feature that you see with perforation peritonitis. But in this case, the gas will be seen around the heart of this person. On an x-ray, I can highlight like this. If these are the lungs, this is the heart, right? So you would be able to see, I'm showing air in black, air just below the heart. That's why we call it continuous diaphragm no? because the diaphragm looks contiguous. So most of the time the air shadow is seen in and around the heart. And why I'm highlighting that is because you see this air is atmospheric air. no? So it will put pressure on the great veins. Therefore, the filling of blood in the right side of the heart is compromised. The venous return definitely takes a hit in this case. The slide that I've discussed here is Boerhaave syndrome has an overlap with surgery. So I would request you to kindly go through that also. And let's do one more case here so that we are more comfortable with the discussion. I'm today describing a case of a 30 year old lady who came to my clinic because she was having excruciating epigastric pain. So on listening to epigastric pain, I prescribed her a PPI, but the pain was so bad that she was like squeezing her epigastric area with her hands and she was literally in tears. So I thought, okay, I told my nurse, give her IV pantoprazole. I thought after half an hour to one hour, pantoprazole will take its effect. This lady will feel fine. But uh, unfortunately, in spite of giving this intervention, the pain is not going away. This lady is also complaining that she's feeling pukish, but there's no vomiting. If I vomit, I'll feel better. These are the words of the patient. She says, if I will vomit, I think something is stuck up here. Something is knotted inside me. I feel if I will puke, I will feel better. She's having nausea, but there is no vomiting present at the moment. She says that if vomiting will occur, I will feel better. So because of the discomfort of this lady, I thought maybe she's having a big ulcer and she's bleeding inside. Let me do a NG tube aspiration just to a stomach wash of this person so that I am, I am more sure about my diagnosis. I have decided to put an NG tube in this patient. She is cooperative. You see, normally when you put in an NG tube because it causes a gag, the person might hold your hand, pull out the tube, stuff like that. She has been gracefully cooperative, but you are not being able to pass the NG tube. You have put so many nasogastric tubes in your career that you're wondering what's going on, man. I mean, you measure the endotracheal tube for the appropriate size, but it's not going inside as if it's stuck somewhere. Well, I'm not discussing a structure of the esophagus, guys, because structure is something that you see with the, uh, some kind of a corrosive acid, acid ingestion in the past. Like in this lady, there's no history of any uh, suicidal attempts in the past. Her mental health is good. So she's never attempted anything wrong with respect to harming herself. She's just come to you today, working professional, successful in a career, maybe a mother of one child, happily married. And today she's having so much of epigastric pain and you are not able to pass an NG tube. Well, what is your diagnosis? The hint is that the triad that I have described here before you is called as Borchardt's triad. In Borchardt's triad, there will be three things. There will be epigastric pain, there's nausea minus vomiting and failure to pass NG tube. Yes, guys, the clinical diagnosis of this lady would be given as stomach volvulus. 
again a topic that will be having a surgical overlap but i want you to be aware of the fact that lots of time patients when they come to you they'll put their hand like this this might be retrosternal pain slash epigastric pain that would be the description in the question but then the key word in this description is this one failure to pass ng tube you don't read this anywhere else in medical literature failure to pass ng tube is what you always read only with the stomach volvulus you are aware of the fact that the stomach volvulus can either be occurring like this from bottom upwards in fairly is the mesentery so he will use the word mesentrico axial volvulus or it might occur like this from the lateral to the medial side that would be referred to as organo axial volvulus so whenever you read regarding the two types of the volvulus the examiner will definitely try to incorporate which is relatively more common so i think you know from surgery that organo axial volvulus is relatively more common than mesentrico axial volvulus what will you do in this case for diagnosis the investigation choice management will obviously be surgery you'll have to open up the patient get the stomach back into a normal situation otherwise this chap has had it i mean there's a distinct possibility that in this individual uh, they might be even gangrene the stomach because the stomach is folded on its own axis the investigation of choice for this condition can either be a barium study but you know to make a person so sick drink barium and then take an x-ray will be a little more difficult so most of the time we will be more comfortable diagnosing this condition with the ct abdomen yes uh, we will try to make the person take oral contrast you see if the person has lost consciousness you can't give oral contrast you just do a plain ct abdomen but in 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 this case at least the person has borne all this pain because sometimes the pain can be so bad that person can develop vasovagal syncope person may not be properly responding to your commands so making a person sick enough not being able to respond to your commands drink something is a little dicey in this particular case though ideally i should go for ct abdomen with oral contrast the contrast will not go forwards in some books it is written that barium contrast studies can be done in these patients they just use this word now i think you would agree to the fact that lots of time in radiology units barium contrast studies may not be available a person skilled enough to interpret that may not be available at the later part of the day so ct abdomen with oral contrast is a reasonable way following which you can definitely handle this patient as i have highlighted before you failure to pass ng tube is a very classical terminology that you need to remember for bochart's triad they've also asked that when you putting a ng tube in a person the patient should be sitting or supine you see if a person is unconscious comatose you can put ng tube in supine position also but in a routine conscious person you should always try to put the ng tube in a sitting position with neck partially flexed the reason why the neck is partially flexed is primarily to prevent any chances of the tube accidentally going into the airway or if god forbid he pukes then the chances of the vomitus going into the airway will be relatively minimized in fact when you putting in the ng tube the moment it goes into the throat the, the gag reflex comes in so you can give a glass of water to the patient with a straw and the moment he will feel the gag you have to tell him don't hold my hand when i'm pushing in the tube don't try to pull the tube out if you feel as if you are having a gag all you need to do is you will have to drink water from the straw so when he will drink water from the straw two things will happen one water will help in lubrication so the tube will be facilitated in going down plus the peristaltic waves themselves will help in carrying the tube down so most of the time when you are putting a ng tube in your patient the patient should be setting up glass of water in his hand with a straw when he when he feels the gag ask him to just sip water and the tube goes into the stomach once the tube is right at its original position in the stomach you will obviously use a 20 ml syringe 50 ml syringe and you need to push air and auscultate over the epigastrium to be sure that the tube is at the right place all of you have put ng tube so many times in your patients that there will absolutely be no problems but the only scenarios where the tube is not going to go is either going to be a nasty structure which is unlikely to come because as such you see if person is already having a stricture that person will seek medical intervention will do an endoscopy will deploy balloon dilatation would have been tried in the person so past medical history will always be given if he wants an answer as a stricture but in this case i described a working professional a young female absolutely no problems with her health previously and now she has had this situation that she is rolling in the bed with epigastric pain and i'm wondering am i having a peptic ulcer perforation but there's no guarding there's no rigidity 
So this could be a question which could be three liner, four liner, depending on if he starts incorporating features which will be ruling out peritonitis, it will obviously become a long question. Currently, the pattern is like this. They are overlapping and integrating the subjects. So that is why these aspects I have highlighted, though you have read them in surgery as well. The next topic that I'll explain to you is gastroesophageal reflux disease. The tone of the sphincter will be substantially reduced in this patient. Why it is reduced could be due to obesity. It could be concomitant alcohol intake, nicotine intake, cigarette smoking. The primary complaints of these patients would be a retrosternal pain. The patient will always put his hand or finger to the chest. You see, if a person is having diffuse chest pain, he will always put his whole of the hand to the chest or maybe a fist to the chest like this to describe the coronary etiology of pain. I mean, person does not know coronary etiology, but if a person is putting his hand like this on his chest, I am thinking that it could be a diffuse chest pain related to cardiac origin. But if he points with his finger like this, that would mainly be gastroesophageal reflux disease. In a large number of these patients, you will read about sour brash, like these patients are sitting on a chair comfortably and suddenly a sour fluid comes in the mouth. Now, acid and teeth, which are having calcium, do not gel together. So, these patients might be having requirement of multiple dental procedures. Dental enamel of these patients can be eroded, mainly in the molar teeth, primarily because of the acid coming, causing damage to the dentine enamel of the tooth. These patients will cough a lot when they are sleeping. They are not going to be aware of it or they may not be distressed by it, but their family members will always say that, why do you cough so much at night? Well, when this person is sleeping, there is a possibility that there might be aspiration of acid. I am not discussing Mendelssohn syndrome. All I am saying is, maybe few drops of acid, few microliters of acid went up from the esophagus into the trachea when this person was sleeping. So, chemical tracheitis will contribute to nocturnal cough in these patients. In fact, there is a distinct possibility that the MCQ of GERD will deliberately by, begin by describing nocturnal cuff and you need to be knowing the nocturnal cuff is also read by you in asthma. If a person is having infection of the adenoids, then this person can be having post-nasal drip and that can also explain the nocturnal cuff. I have today taught you three reasons for why nocturnal cuff could be present. It could be asthma, it could be post-nasal drip due to infected adenoids or gastroesophageal reflux disease. A lot of these patients might be coming to your clinic for recurrent courses of antibiotics because initially when they came to you, all they told was that I'm having a sore throat. So you thought it is some infection, a bacterial infection. You prescribed antibiotics like augmentin or azithromycin, whatever. But you now are realizing that this person was actually having tendency for recurrent sore throats, not because the person was having any infection. It was the chemical laryngitis component responsible for it. Due to GERD, the patient will also be distressed and with anxiety, the symptoms will worsen. The investigation choice for this condition is 24-hour pH monitoring. You are aware of this, no big deal. The question in the exam said, esophageal pH should be less than how much to call it gastroesophageal reflux disease. Then remember a value of pH less than 4 for a duration at least more than 4 hours on a daily basis. I repeat the statement. If you document by 24 hour pH monitoring that the pH is less than 4 for more than 4 hours per day, it is diagnostic of gastroesophageal reflux disease. The main treatment for this person will be proton pump inhibitors and you can obviously have improvement in the condition by adding prokinetic agents. In 24 hour pH monitoring, you would be putting in a probe. This probe will be having sensors. The sensors will be recording the pH of the esophagus and the pH of the stomach. In the exam, he was so specific that he even went to the level of asking that this sensor will be present how many centimeter away from the lower esophageal sphincter. I want you to remember that the sensor of the esophagus and the sensor in the stomach both are present 5 cm away from the lower esophageal sphincter. You can see the LES have shown in uh, blue color and the sensors in color red. So just remember this value here which was again a technical aspect that was asked and usually we do not expect such detailed technical aspects to be asked in the exam. For the treatment of this condition as I have said plain PPI can definitely be used but you will notice that if you combine pantoprazole with domperidone or with prokinetic agents then the relief of the person is relatively better because see the problem in this chap is lots of time not more acid it is actually acid going up so if you give a prokinetic agent then the incidence of severity of illness will resolve even faster the main drug of choice is ppa no issues with this 
I just said that if you will add etopride, cisopride has been banned from the market. I presume you are aware of it because cisopride causes torsades pointers that have discussed in cardiology. So nowadays we do not have cisopride, we have etopride, we have mozopride available or the traditional domperidone can be used as a 30 milligram sustained release capsule that will help in improvement of this patient. If GRD symptoms are persistent in a patient, then we also need to keep in mind a possibility of hiatus hernia. The topic of hiatus hernia has to be read by you from surgical domain because there are two of them rolling hernia and sliding hernia. So please read that from the surgical domain. I just want to add the fact that the question in the exam said Cameron ulcer because traditionally we have studied peptic ulcer. You will study regarding curling ulcer or burns, Cushing ulcer or raised ICT. The question said Cameron ulcer is found in, remember the statement of mine, Cameron ulcer is found in hiatus hernia. Curling ulcer is seen with burns in the duodenum, but Cushing ulcer is found in the stomach. I repeat the statement again. I'm not writing it because you, you are aware of it, but you tend to neglect it. Cushing ulcer of raised ICP is more common in the stomach and the curling ulcer of burns is more common in the duodenum. Now, if uh, a person is having gastroesophageal reflux disease, then the bad news is that he can develop a Barrett's esophagus. Slide of Barrett's esophagus from pathology is always, always asked, what are you going to look at? You are going to look at presence of goblet cells in a slide of esophagus. I mean, goblet cells are in the small intestine. Now, goblet cells in the esophagus because the epithelium of the esophagus would be a traditional, traditional columnar epithelium. Here, you are having interspersed with goblet cells, which is definitely not normal. The investigational choice for Barrett's esophagus is upper GA endoscopy with biopsy. Though the color of the mucosa in Barrett's esophagus is also different, I want you to understand per se the fact that when it comes to Barrett's, the best way for diagnosis is a combination of endoscopy with a biopsy. It would be a punch biopsy and then you will go for surgical resection of the afflicted part. He will also ask you here that if you are going to resect some part of the esophagus then what are you going to do for that component so please appreciate the fact that if you remove some part of the esophagus we are not going to put colon there which was done when i was a student we used to read about colon transposition now we go in for stomach mobilization the surgical details you will obviously be familiar with and will read in surgery also but i just want to highlight the fact that this condition is having a metaplasia followed by a dysplasia Please remember the fact that if the question says what is the most common type of metaplasia, please appreciate that I'm talking generally. I'm not speaking about what is the change that is occurring in Barrett's esophagus that I know you are aware of squamous to columnar. In the exam he said what is the most common type of metaplasia then the answer is not going to be given as please appreciate my statement overall in the body the most common type of metaplasia that you encounter is columnar to squamous. The concept is that in our lungs we are having a ciliated columnar epithelium and that ciliated columnar epithelium will now get transited into a squamous that would be a squamous cell cancer in genesis so do remember these aspects that i have highlighted in the discussion before you and well i can just finish by saying that uh, traditionally they say luck favors the brave here i'm saying fortune favors the prepared mind for you guys, as I've highlighted, I'm going to repeat again, guys, knowledge is power. And if you have mental strength, you can definitely overcome all kinds of odds. You will be able to handle your patients better. You will be able to handle your finances better. You will be able to handle your relationships relatively better. So if you are going to just focus on your career at the moment, because multiple things can't work together. If you just focus on your career at the moment, make every day count. Let whatever the government wants to do, let the government do. You just focus on your books and your study and once you get out of college if you have a stable career then everything else will fall into place but if it's social media that's predominating as i always highlight internet darkness is to be practiced guys just sacrifice a few more months and let me say a year more of your career into studies and i'm very sure that you'll come out with br brilliant results and brilliant brilliant careers ahead you guys are bright chaps you are not even aware of how qualified you guys are indian people and indian population indian politicians don't realize your worth but i'm very very sure that if you are going to put in your best efforts you're going to come up with great results thank you so much for hearing me out